have ground rules here. They're pretty simple. There are cards downstairs. If you want to speak, or if you have a question to ask, if you want to have a question, that's not speaking. Uh, if you have a question to ask, please fill one of those out. They will be very simple forms. All they do is have a topic on them. Your question can be related to that topic. That's all. So the questions are not pre vetted uh, or whatever. They're random. With, with that, time is short, so we're going to introduce Senator Kelly. I first met Excuse Senator me. Kelly when she was. Uh, legal counsel to Governor Benson. Then she moved on to become Attorney General and reappointed as Gen Attorney General by uh, John Lynch, Governor Lynch. I'll keep that simple and short. Senator Ayotte. Thank you. Smith, uh, Smokey, for being here and for doing this, and uh, really appreciate it. And we were just uh, reminiscing that the last time we did one together, we had to actually go out and look for people to come to it. So we, we you know, I appreciate you you're all being here today. And uh, I also want to thank some of the uh, the really the people who serve you at the state level, who do a tremendous job and work very very hard including our state representatives, uh, State Representative Jane Johnson, State Representative Frank Sterling, uh, and also uh, the Sheriff, Sheriff Eli Rivera, uh, Sergeant Len DeSalvo, I thank him so much for being here. I know I saw former Sheriff Foote here, appreciate his leadership, and then uh, leader from uh, the national level, Ambassador Joe and Augusta Patron, so thank you. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I also want to say to our state reps, and uh, Representative Smith knows this, our state reps only make $100 a year, and uh, they work very hard, and I'm very appreciative of uh, all their, everything that they do uh, to help us. So what I'm going to do today is, I have, uh, this is something I said I would do when I ran for office, that I would do a town hall meeting in uh, every county every year that I was in office. And I've done that in the last uh, two years, and I'm doing it again this year, and I'll continue to do it. Uh, and we're doing this town hall the same format that I've done every town hall that I've had so far. Uh, and what we're going to do is I'm going to go through a, a PowerPoint presentation on a variety of topics. Uh, my town halls um, have mostly focused on the fiscal state of the country. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on that today, uh, because that really does impact so many other issues in Washington. And uh, so let me just get going and then I'll open it up to all of you. These are the committees that I serve on the, in uh, the United States Senate. And by the way, let me just say up front, you can see I'm a little hoarse, so please uh, bear with me today. Uh, I've got a cold, but Armed Services, Budget, Commerce, Homeland Security, and Special Committee on Aging. I know that many of you are here uh, because of the recent legislation uh, on the floor uh, on how to address uh, violence and particularly focused on gun violence. Uh, I wanted to go through uh, what measures I did support. I did not support uh, a measure that I know uh, some of you have uh, various thoughts on Mansion Toomey because I thought the focus should be on focusing on fixing our current background check system and also uh, pieces of mental health and law enforcement, in particular enhanced prosecution. So I did support a piece of legislation that will uh, get the records that aren't getting in our, our current background check system in there. Uh, also increased resources for prosecution of gun crimes that I believe can be done much more vigorously. Uh, addressing gaps in our mental health system in criminalizing straw purchasing and gun trafficking, enhancing school safety resources and programs. Um, I, I appreciate the reaction, certainly you all can react. I just want to make sure I get through as much so we can get to your questions, because I know that's why you're, you're here today, and I really appreciate it. Uh, whatever your viewpoint, thank you for coming out to be part of the town hall. Um, 17 states right now, including and all five U.S. territories. What happened is after the Virginia Tech uh, shootings a number of years ago, uh, there was a realization that uh, right now under federal law, if you are adjudicated a danger to yourself 
or others uh, in the court system, then you are prohibited from having a firearm. Those records weren't getting in the system, and frankly, they still, many states, they are not getting in the system. And those are the states that there are a number of, over, if you combine the territories, almost a majority are not putting them in now. New Hampshire has only submitted two records, and I can tell you from having worked in this system uh, as an attorney general and a murder prosecutor, that uh, there are many more individuals in our state that would fall under that category. So we are one of the states that we've got to get those records in. And that's why uh, I believe the focus should be on getting those records in. Um, the other issue is, is that when people do attempt to get a firearm that are prohibited from having it now, whether it's a felon, uh, there are certain domestic violence convictions that are prohibited right now. Uh, we've talked about those that have been adjudicated a danger to themselves or others. Um, those, the statistics we had from 2010 were, um, and this was testimony that came before the Senate Judiciary Committee, this is how I got uh, this data, was about 76,000 denials from, the NICS system is the background check system, that's the abbreviation for it. And if you combine those that were uh, felonies or other convictions, disqualifying convictions, of crimes and fugitives from justice, you've got almost 47,000 of the 76,000 uh, that were in the criminal criminal realm uh, that uh, were denied. But who, who, what were the consequences for that? Only 62 were referred for prosecution, only 44 charges brought, and only 13 successful prosecutions. Uh, I can tell you that right now there aren't any teeth in terms of people even going right now to using the background check system and thinking that there's going to be a consequence if uh, you're a criminal uh, attempting to get a firearm through legitimate means. And I will tell you this, that uh, most criminals will get their guns uh, on the street from other criminals or steal them as well, which wouldn't cover any of this. So that's why I wanted to support additional uh, the legislation I did support would create a task force that would bring further emphasis on prosecuting these types of crimes so that people on the street know that there is a consequence for violating our laws right now that frankly uh, I don't think they probably feel if you look, look at the statistics. From 2007 to 2011, the Department of Justice actually charged fewer firearms cases. Um, and in each year they brought fewer cases from the year before. And if you look at it, uh, the numbers that are being prosecuted, really this is very, very few uh, compared to the number of violations that we know are out there. So I'm hoping this is an area where we can find bipartisan agreement moving forward. Um, all of these mass violence situations, the recent ones, uh, seem to have, particularly ones where we had multiple victims uh, seem to have a mental health component, unfortunately. And um, mental health has been an issue that we've had a lot of work that needs to be done in the criminal justice system, as well as just having resources and ability to intervene at an early level for people that have mental health issues to make sure that they can get the treatment that they need so they aren't in a position, obviously, um, to commit acts of mass violence. So I have worked on and supported a number of bipartisan efforts. In fact, this combined group of legislation did come up for a vote on the Senate floor. I will tell you it got over 90 votes. Um, so while the legislation that was pending was pulled from the floor, uh, I, I think this is areas where we should bring this back up and, and this is an area where we should be doing more to improve our mental health system. And I'm hoping that that is the case as we go forward. Um, I, I certainly will be opening up to all kinds of questions on this. I'm going to move through a number of topics in addition that are on the floor in the Senate, and then we'll move it up to all of you. Sequestration. Uh, sequestration is, uh, you, I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. It's across the board cuts uh, that are in place right now uh, to discretionary spending. So those cuts really address about 40% of what we spend our money on, and that area of spending all received, uh, received most of the cuts. I thought from the beginning that that wasn't uh, the best way to cut spending. It had been almost four years since in the United States Senate since we had done a budget, and frankly prioritizing and deciding 
uh, what is it our priorities are rather than doing it across the board approach, I think is a smarter way. So getting back to budgeting in a regular way, I think, is a smarter way to do things and to get a hold of our debt. And in fact, uh, I will tell you that uh, one issue I wanted to touch briefly on was sequestration is there was a lot of discussion about uh, it becoming more difficult to travel over the air uh, because the FAA was going to furlough air traffic controllers and there were going to be, uh, you know, I'm sure you heard a lot of media about a lot of delays at the airport. Uh, before we left uh, to come back home, uh, there was bipartisan legislation passed to give the FAA more flexibility within, still making the cuts, but within their appropriations. They had some unappropriated funds uh, that they weren't going to use otherwise, that we were able to allow them to shift to stop that. So um, this is an area where I think if we are able to give agencies more flexibility to be able to manage their money more wisely and prioritize it, we're going to be able to address many of the impacts uh, of sequestration in the short term. Uh, so we were able to do that, which is good if you're worried about that. Um, one issue that I want to bring up to you that's, I think, very important to the state of New Hampshire uh, you know, I don't know if we have any online businesses here today, but there is an effort in Washington to uh, create what it, the effort is called the Main Street uh, Marketplace Fairness Act. And you know what I like to call it? I like to call it the Online Sales Tax Collection Act. Because this is an effort uh, to make New Hampshire online businesses, and frankly every online business across the nation, the tax collectors for other states. Now, New Hampshire has made a choice not to have a sales tax, and we have, along with uh, four other states, there's only five states in the country that don't have a sales tax, and so it's particularly onerous on our state because basically our online retailers, if this legislation passes, will now have to collect sales taxes for other states, but it's not just other states because many states don't just have a state sales tax, they have a county sales tax, they have a local sales tax, and it adds up to about 9,600 tax jurisdictions. And so if a New Hampshire online retailer is selling to a, a, a customer in Illinois, that retailer is going to figure out, okay, where do you live in Illinois? And in uh, one town, the uh, rate in Illinois may be 7%. In another town, the rate may be 8%. And so you can imagine uh, the burdens that will create on online businesses, but it's not just in New Hampshire, across the country. It's one of the reasons that I've certainly imposed that I think it, it's, uh, it's a, similar to what we've seen in Massachusetts, trying to force us to collect their, uh, for their people when they come over to buy things from New Hampshire. So this is pending on the floor right now. I'll tell you, uh, on a bipartisan basis, uh, myself and Senator Shaheen will oppose this. We have... Uh, I've heard from a lot of businesses, but here's what I want to bring you an update. We're going to have a vote on this on Monday when we return. And I unfortunately expect, uh, despite I can tell you using every procedural means I can, including vigorous debate on the Senate floor, this thing is likely to pass. So um, it goes over to the House of Representatives. The reason I raise it with all of you is this is going to be bad for New Hampshire businesses, and I hope uh, as it goes over to the House, I plan to continue my efforts of the businesses that have contacted me of making sure we get them in touch with our representatives. So hopefully we can stop this effort in the House, and that's why I still bring it to your attention, because it's important. Your voice really matters on this. Um, now I'd like to talk about the fiscal state of the country, where we are. Uh, this, is, this is the reason when I decided uh, to run for office. Uh, because, frankly, it was a real privilege to serve as Attorney General of our state. Um, it was a, certainly a, a rewarding position uh, in terms of the people that I got to work with in law enforcement. But why I decided to run for Senate is I'm really worried, uh, I think as many of you are, uh, that where the fiscal state of the country is and what that means for the strength of America going forward, not only for this generation, but thinking about what we're passing on to future generations. And so just looking at the, sh the snapshot of where we've recently been in 2012, we're running a, a $1.1 trillion deficit. Uh, we've got almost a $17 trillion debt. And that's sort of what it looks like graphically of where we've been. 
going back to 2007. And unfortunately, unless we make some changes and really come up with uh, some fiscal reform in Washington, it will look like that going forward. In fact, the debt is uh, will get to $26 trillion if we continue on the current path in the next 10 years. So let's put it in perspective. You know, people, I think, sometimes feel like the debt is so far out there. What does it mean? And I like to put it in real terms. Some of you have seen, sometimes I do it, how many Dunkin' Donuts coffees you can buy, how many Red Sox tickets, but here we are. Uh, you can pay for all the 2013 salaries of every professional baseball player at MLB for 318 years. All the monthly cell phone bills for every person in America for 44 years, and you know we all like to talk. And uh, this one, I think, uh, really brings it home. The fact that we can pay for the average yearly cost of food for every household in America for the next two years. Think about that in terms of you know, where you want your priorities to be, whether it's defense of the nation, whether it's a safety net, and the things that the people that, that need, you know, need, need the hand up. Here is the, uh, here's what we're spending our money on. 16% uh, is on autopilot. You look at some of the programs that I'm sure many in this room are already relying on, uh, or you know, are in a position where they know someone who needs these programs, whether it's Social Security, Medicare, uh, Medicaid. Look at how big the interest payments are now. Um, you should know this, where interest is right now, the Federal Reserve is keeping interest rates very low, um, historically low, almost at zero. And with a 1% increase in interest rates, just a 1%, and as our economy, we hope will tick up more, that a couple of percentage points will not be unusual. Every 1% is another trillion dollars to our debt over the next 10 years. And the increase in the interest payments become so much greater. And so that's why there's an urgency to this. Uh, the other issues who owns our debt, uh, going back to 1970, 6%, for, uh, foreign owned, now 48%. The largest single foreign old owner of our debt is China, who owns about a trillion dollars of our debt. And so I, I think all of us would agree uh, we don't want other countries to have any kind of influence over us so that we can make our, you know, to be in a position where we don't want to be the debtor to other countries. So I always say that the debt is a bipartisan problem, that it took two parties to get us into debt, and it will absolutely take two parties to get us out of debt. And uh, I think the numbers demonstrated, uh, whoever's been in the White House, uh, that we've spent too much money. Again, to put in some of the figures I've already told you, we stay where we are, we end up about $26 trillion in debt in the coming decade. And um, I mentioned to you earlier, one of the committees that I serve on is the Senate Budget Committee. And uh, the first two years in the Senate, when I got on that committee, I was glad to get on it. Judd Gregg was chair of the committee at one point. Um, and we never, we never met to mark up a budget. The Senate never did a budget. Uh, the Senate Democrats had decided they weren't going to do a budget. I was very disappointed by that. So much so, I was a supporter of the legislation that we shouldn't get paid without a budget. And so here we are. Is, uh, the good news is this, to go back here. Um, the good news is we did do a, bed, a budget markup this year. The Senate Democrats did a budget. The House did a budget. Um, I could not support the Senate Democrats' budget. Uh, it was a trillion dollars in new taxes that I thought, when I show you the economic numbers, would have really hurt our economy where we are right now. Uh, because we've got two things we've got to do to get out of debt. We've got to get uh, our fiscal house in order and we've got to grow our economy. The two have to both happen for us to get out of debt. And I look at uh, these are the graphically the two budgets that were on the, the two major budgets that were on the table. The uh, the green one is the the president's budget, which by the way did not come up for a vote because he gave it submitted it to us late after the House and Senate had already done their budget work. Um, but the Senate Democrat has this the budget that we did vote on has a similar trajectory. The House budget has, uh, spends about $5 trillion less over a 10-year window than the, and that's the budget I did support, and it balances in the 10th year uh, of the 10-year window. Budgeting in Washington is done, they look out in a 10-year window. 
Um, this is just looking historically to where we've been. If you go back to where we were in 1963, the, the shift in spending has really changed. Uh, where much more spending was in the discretionary end, and now much more spending is in the sort of autopilot, social insurance, mandatory spoken. And this is what those programs look like going forward. Um, they will eat up every single federal dollar where we are now, um, just without even getting to the spending of the defense of the nation, the military spending, without any discretionary spending, whether it's on things like the FAA or education. I mean, that, that excludes all that type of spending, uh, whatever priority you believe should be for the, for the federal government. Some of the biggest drivers of our debt and the biggest challenges that we face in terms of the fiscal state of the country are uh, programs like Medicare and Social Security, which are very important programs, I'm sure, to many people in this room who may be recipients or on the way to recipients, or I'm blessed to have uh, two grandparents in their 90s that are still with us, that uh, you know, that's what they rely on uh, to be able to get health care as well as to uh, support themselves. And so we've got a, a, a solid I'm really messing up my shot, but go ahead. Medicare goes bankrupt. That's not long enough. Uh, you think about it. And the average family, just thinking about it, we're living longer. The average family pays in about $119,000 in payroll taxes, but is taking out about $357,000. I mean, we're all glad we're living longer, but we've got to figure out uh, how we sustain these programs so that they're there in the future. Uh, and 2033 Social Security, again, runs into a similar issue. This just shows where we are in terms of people working. Uh, when Social Security started, there were a lot more, or before that, 1950, you think there were a lot more people working for every beneficiary or recipient. And so this is the challenge with people retiring and the baby boomers retiring. Uh, so sometimes people will come to you and say, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm for making no changes to these programs. And if, in my view, if someone comes and says that to you, that means they're for bankruptcy. Because uh, with Social Security, if we get to 2033 and we haven't made any changes, it's 25% less than you would receive under Social Security. Um, assuming you know we could just keep borrowing and borrowing at some point, you get to a point. Uh, so the issue really is, is that what responsible changes can we make? And I think making them now, so that perhaps younger people like me uh, I will have to plan whether I have to uh, work longer uh, or whether it's a situation where we're looking at means testing or issues like that. So the making sure that we can protect current beneficiaries, because that's, I think, a very, very important premise of whatever we do, but also making sure that younger people know what it's going to be uh, so that they can plan for their retirement. And the longer we put off the decisions, the harder that they become. So why does debt matter? It's not just that you know, common sense, why are we spending money we don't have, and, and different than what you all do at home in your business, but it also impacts economic growth. Economists that have looked at this have said, you get to a point uh, where your total debt exceeds 90% of the size of your economy and it, it can hurt your ability to grow jobs. Um, and jobs, we talked about the, the debt making responsible reforms to our entitlement program. Uh, entitlement programs and, and cutting wasteful spending wherever we can in Washington. Uh, but we need to grow the economy. Because uh, when you look back historically when we've had good times in terms of the fiscal state of the country, we've been booming. And we're not booming right now, I think we can all agree on that. Um, and the numbers show that. That uh, we've had many people dropping out of the labor force. That's one of the disappointing things. We have over 7% uh, unemployment rate nationally, but too many people have lost hope and left the labor force. And uh, we keep, in my view, doing things in Washington that are making it more difficult, uh, including issues of increasing taxes. This 1.7 would include the uh, tax increases that are in to pay for the President's health care law, the Affordable Care Act, uh, new regulations. And I often hear from businesses in New Hampshire, I'll tell you there's not a business that I have visited in New Hampshire that doesn't have a story for me. 
on things that they have to fill out or do that don't really add to safety but make it more difficult to do business. And so I have supported a number of efforts to cut through to make the regulatory process more efficient in Washington, to try to take a common sense approach to say, yes, we protect health and safety, but we, we can't go over, we have to make sure that the regulations aren't just added paperwork for people. And so I'm always asking for New Hampshire businesses for feedback. Healthcare law, the Affordable Care Act, uh, there's still regulations coming out from it. Uh, if I had the regulations that were out here with me today, it'd be about this big. It's very, very difficult for people to understand. And so I hear a lot about that um, on, as I name it, businesses in New Hampshire and individuals as well. And so uh, right now, we, regardless, I did not support uh, the law from the beginning, but it's clear to me that if we don't make some changes to it, uh, it, there's been, it, it's not, it, there are a lot of problems in terms of implementing it that are hurting our economy. And also, I was at a town hall two days ago and I had a man who shared a story with me where his wife, who's a nurse, they're going to drop her hours uh, below so that she doesn't fit within the definition of a full-time employee so that they don't have to provide benefits. And so we can't have a law where I hear stories from businesses that say, I'm not going to add the next, go to the 51st employee because I'm subject to it and I just can't afford it. It's not that I don't care about my employees and want to give them health care. It's just so these issues have to be addressed because ultimately I believe that the law right now is suppressing hiring and causing people to get less hours than they would want but how it defines a full-time employee. There have been some discussions about changing some of these provisions and I hope those discussions continue in Washington because I don't believe this is going to work. Um, medical device tax, I will, that's the last thing and then I'm going to turn it all over to you. Uh, medical device tax is an issue that one of the ways that the Affordable Care Act was funded was through taxing medical devices. That's anything from orthodontics to the most uh, complex life-saving devices. There are some exemptions, but, but it's really limited. And this has been an area where, frankly, there's been, there was a vote on the budget resolution to repeal this law. It's non-binding, but it got over 70 votes because there's a lot of concerns that were going to hurt jobs in this area, that were also going to raise health care costs. So this is an area, keep uh, watching. I think that we will repeal this uh, portion of the law because there seems to be bipartisan support for that the effect of this is having a negative effect on an important industry for our country. I'll end with this. Uh, it's my hope that uh, we will come to a large, significant uh, deal. It has to be bipartisan. The Republicans are in, house, are in charge of the House. The Democrats are in charge of the Senate. We've got, uh, obviously, the President Obama as a Democrat to address the fiscal state of the country. Because uh, if you look at where we are, I showed you where the spending was on the social insurance, the entitlement programs that are going to be bankrupt for those people that uh, are relying on them. If we don't address them and make responsible reforms, and also, in my view, address our tax code, which has become overcomplicated, needs to be simplified, and we can have a much fairer tax code that's simpler, that hopefully is better, that doesn't pick winners and losers, but really focuses on uh, appropriately collecting revenue in a fair way. Uh, I think that opportunity is there in the coming months. We have to discuss raising the debt ceiling again uh, in August, I believe. And so uh, this is, I had dinner with the president two weeks ago. I had all the women in the Senate there, there are 20 of us. And this is what I asked him, I said, I think this is the time, Mr. President, that we really get together a significant deal for this country that puts us on a sustainable track at least for 50 years, 75 years with these programs because um, ultimately everything else will get crowded out. The choices, whatever your priority is, by interest payments and will sap the strength of America. So I will end on that and I will uh, open it up to all of you. These are my offices, so thank you for your patience. And, um,
Yes. Uh, Senator, uh, I agree with you that uh, more access to health care is needed. And you mentioned some of the bills. Are you uh, initiating any bills, or what, are, what else are you doing to uh, making health care accessible to those who need it? Um, Alan, I think what, uh, what I've been focusing on is obviously the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I wasn't, wasn't a supporter of it. Uh, but trying to uh, be in a position where if there are changes we can make now given, you know, given the fact that we've got uh, Republicans and Democrats and, and it's a bipartisan, so no matter how you felt about the Affordable Care Act, uh, that uh, the goal as I understood the Affordable Care Act was to provide access to people for health care. But some of the impacts of it have, are, I think, are having the opposite effect with people who have their insurance right now in terms of wanting to keep what they have. So my focus has been on several pieces of legislation that I have supported that would modify that to make it more workable. I mentioned uh, the medical device issue. Uh, I've also supported uh, several budget, uh, budget resolution. I've supported several amendments that would help on the uh, 29 hour issue for employees because how we're defining a part-time employee right now is actually encouraging uh, creating a situation where employers are reducing hours to define someone as part-time and people want to work more. So that has been my focus. What I would like to see us do um, is also open up our insurance markets further. Um, I'm a strong supporter of competition for insurance companies across state lines. In New Hampshire right now as a business you have three, uh, roughly three choices and I believe that you should have choices just like you have with driver's insurance across the nation, so I'd like us to move in that direction as well. Um, and I've also supported efforts, uh, legislation uh, on the budget resolution that would impose uh, medical liability reform because I hear a lot from our doctors that uh, right now they feel like they're practicing defensive medicine. And I think that there's a way we can do that that still allows people who are legitimately injured to receive compensation but allows doctors to be able to focus on their patients. So those are the efforts that I have supported right now on, on the healthcare front. And I obviously, uh, I've been also working with Dartmouth, uh, the Atlas Project in Dartmouth. Uh, the head of that hospital, Jim Weinstein, has some really done some very, very important work on how we can better deliver Medicare uh, in a more uh, quality way and more affordable. So I'm hoping we can take some of those efforts as we do entitlement reform, so I hope to be part of that discussion as well. Next question. Joe Patron on energy. Hi, Ambassador. I just heard about a wonderful speech for Senator Davis. And I think this is, I wish we had 20 of them like it. But anyway, this is on energy. We got a Keystone Pipeline in this country, and maybe Canada. We got a lot of unemployment. Well, I'll tell you what it can do. It can take you off from this unemployment, but also it can be the first step into making this country uh, absolutely auto independent. And your money will start coming in too, because as a good senator told us, we're we need a little money. And that'll get it to us. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ambassador. There have been several instances, including on the budget resolution, where the approval for the Keystone Pipeline has come up for a vote. I have supported it. Um, ultimately, what I would like to see us do, I think, as many, many here believe, uh, energy independence is very important for our economy and very important for our security as well. Uh, but we now are, we now realize that we have new ways to recover natural gas uh, through uh, fracking that we weren't aware of before. So we have some real opportunities uh, in this country to develop a strong energy plan that does include all of the above. And I do think that it, it does need to be, it, it's not just, it's oil, natural gas, but it's also renewables. It is also, uh, I will, will, will say, um, we can do it with protecting our environment. And I think that, that striking that balance is very important. Uh, and time for us to move forward with legislative efforts. That's why I've supported the pipeline, but I will continue to support efforts 
to make sure that we can recover our own natural resources in responsible ways. Well, God bless you. <laughs> this country can come out of this with a good set of shoulders. How far we are in debt, this could do it. Energy independence. And, and energy will help manufacturing too, which means obviously the more manufacturing we can have in this country. Yes, the next question is from John Keenan. What's wrong with universal background check? John. Uh, I've received your, I've received your uh, four-page letter regarding uh, guns and background checks. I, I really don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me. What, what is wrong with universal background? My, I've, I've described it for you, but I will tell you in terms of a universal background check uh, as, it's, as it's been framed, I have a lot of concerns about uh, that leading to a registry that will uh, create a privacy situation for lawful firearms owners. However, I do believe that our current system should be fixed, and that's why I supported legislation. For example, we have as the law of the land right now that if you are adjudicated mentally ill or found dangerous uh, by a court through due process, uh, that you should be included in the system if those people aren't getting in the system. And that those who try to violate the system should be fully prosecuted. And uh, so that is why I supported the legislation I did. I believe that the focus should be on focusing, uh, fixing the broken system right now. Uh, I think there are efforts we can take and I actually hope that uh, I know people have strong feelings about this issue. I hope that we will be able to take some of the steps that we can agree on, uh, rather than just you know, obviously pulling legislation from the floor. So, uh, so that is what I will continue to focus on, enhancing and fixing the broken system, uh, more prosecution, and finally, mental health. Ultimately, mental health is an area that, uh, particularly in these mass funding situations, we should I think be able to come to some improvements on that we can move forward with. The next question is from Chris Leon, and there's a comment to support your gun vote. Well, Chris, do you have a question? I do. I, I do have a question. <coughs> I, I thought it's important. Your position on the uh, gun measures that, that came out. And, um, I'm very thankful that we have you as a senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see this time to time as you pay attention to what happens in Washington. The bills come out, and some of them are thousands of pages long. And for anybody to reasonably consider that somebody can read that and interpret that and actually vote. I didn't have a conscience, it's completely ridiculous. Any bill that is over, I, I would even say 50 pages, it doesn't need to be 50 pages long, it should be automatically rejected. And all those gun bills that came out of the thousands of pages, just like the healthcare bill, nobody that nobody even read it, if they did, could understand what they read. And you have a team of lawyers that have interpreted it. And this is continuously coming out of Washington, so I, I, I want to applaud you again for for your courage and sticking your ground and supporting our gun rights. Thank you. Can I, can I just mention an issue that I think uh, crosses everything, which is important. To the extent that we can, in Washington, really use the regular order process in a way that it hasn't been used, whatever the legislation is, whether it's uh, how to prevent gun violence or whether it is immigration, whatever the issue is, going through a regular committee process instead of something just being brought in the last minute to the floor um, where it hasn't had the full public vetting and it hasn't had the careful study time. I, I think that benefits legislation 
regardless of what uh, what the legislation is. And so, I, I you know I certainly hope uh, as we go forward on important issues, I know that's the process that's being followed right now. For example, for immigration, I I, I think that's important to go through a committee process to go through because a lot of the legislation that we vote on just comes it gets dropped on the floor. Um, instead of having gone through where you can weigh in and say, this part will work, this part I can agree with, this part I don't want. So, um, you know, and also I believe debate is important. Uh, some, some, you know, I know some people didn't like it when I didn't want, when I voted to debate the issue uh, of how do we address gun violence. But I am always going to be someone that is for open debate, uh, and I think that's very important in our democracy. So. Let me just uh, get to the other questions I know. <clears throat> Julie Flood Page has a question about taxes. Hi, Julie. Why would you choose to cut Social Security benefits, which help all the people, instead of, instead of raising Social Security taxes on just people, some of whom have $50,000 health benefits and double million dollar incomes? as part of their compensation packages? Uh, Julie, I think um, in terms of reforming Social Security that uh, there are a whole host of things that need to be looked at. Um, we're going to have to come through to a bipartisan compromise. As you know, uh, the last time we reformed Social Security, it was Ronald Reagan and Tim O'Neill, and they were able to come to an agreement to sustain the program and in that agreement, uh, right now, the president has proposed in his budget, he proposed changing um, the rate upon which the COLA is done, called chain CPI. Um, that's one issue that we'll be looking at. And there, uh, the other pieces are, I, I believe that we should look at things like means testing. And so you can look at it as a means testing portion for people that make more, or you can look at it, do we raise the cap? I think all of it will be discussed. And uh, ultimately, if we don't make some reforms, uh, what we can come to an agreement on, we should do uh, the best we can to protect the people in and now and to make the program going sustainable forward. So I look forward to the discussion on all those possibilities and seeing if we can come to some kind of agreement to preserve the program. So I understand there's a couple of different ways we can get there, uh, and we're going to have to get bipartisan support around one of those ways. Would you support raising the cap? Uh, I, I can't say I would support that, but I will absolutely look at it as one of the possibilities if we have a discussion on this. I know that's one of the ways we can get there, or we can means test, or we can gradually raise. Uh, so all of those, I think, to have an honest bipartisan discussion, I'm not going to preclude, uh, you know, any particular possibility, but I want to have a discussion of all what's the best way forward that we can get agreement around so we can preserve this program so it doesn't go bankrupt in 2033. Next question is from Joanne, and the question is on budget or economy. I just wanted to give her this um, thing I took out of the paper that said the vets spend $890,000 on fees for empty accounts. And it goes on to say how these accounts are closed, but they're still paying the fees. It's, uh, it's outrageous. I agree with you. Um, the Homeland Security Committee is trying to get these agencies to close their accounts, and I think we're going to have another hearing on it. It's just absurd. It's indefensible. We're paying fees on accounts that we don't need anymore in the federal government that are closed. Uh, you know, we haven't closed. Basically, someone in Washington hasn't taken the effort to close an account we don't need anymore, and uh, we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars and any even more million dollars. It's crazy. So uh, the Homeland Security Committee is, along with uh, Dr. Coburn, who's the Republican ranking committee, we're going to crack down on this because it's just, I mean, you can't defend that. It's ridiculous. Senator John O'Brien has a question on Benghazi. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Senator Ray. I live in Hudson, New Hampshire, and it is before Benghazi. There are a number of people that live in Hudson that know I was going to get today, and some from the contiguous city of Nashville that asked me to relay to you their full support and thank you for the hard work that you do for us. They couldn't be here today because of our commitments. Benghazi, I want to ask you a question about Benghazi because I know it's a terrific leadership of you, Senator McCain, and Senator Graham. 
who have been keeping Benghazi on the front line, even though they've been trying to push it aside. Where I'm very bothered about this is that this was an American consul, meaning American soil, which means these Americans were murdered by foreign nationals, perhaps enemy combatants. And the first attack, second attack happened seven or eight hours before they died. No one showed up to aid them. That bothers me. Our allies and our potential enemies are sizing up our government's ability and willingness to protect American citizens. What I'm concerned, Senator, is that Benghazi may go the way of Fast and Furious, where again, federal law enforcement were murdered on U.S. soil by foreign nationals in the act of commit committing a number of felonies, and some of them were using weapons that were provided by the American government. What bothers me a lot is that the press, Secretary Connie, I believe it was yesterday, in the press conference, was trying to say, Benghazi was a long time ago. The War of 1812 was a long time ago. In nine days, Benghazi will be eight months ago. I just hope that we're able to get the truth out, not only to the American people, but to the world as to what happened, at least in Benghazi, if not for the Furious. service member who has said that there were assets in the area uh, that could have responded during. Uh, this was a, a second two-wave attack, as John said. The first one came on the consulate, and then the second one came on the annex, the CIA annex, about seven hours later. And so one of the questions we've always had from the beginning is, when something occurs over a seven-hour period, given the situation that was happening in Benghazi, why, didn't we, why weren't we able to provide support for those individuals sooner? Uh, military support and so uh, there's going to be in the last uh, day I have called again um, with along with Senators McCann and Graham for a select committee uh, we wrote uh, we wrote the president asking for the actual eyewitnesses to come forward uh, to be given protection uh, to make sure that we respect their what they've been through but to give them uh, proper legal protection as well because there's been some expression at least that some may uh, that there may be some concerns, that there, there could be, you know, employment type of retribution. So for people to come forward, there needs to be that kind of legal protection. So the House of Representatives is going to have a hearing on this, as I understand it, next week. So I'm going to continue to pursue this just because um, I've actually been, I was really surprised at what it took to get information about this on something that was uh, an obvious event where you have four uh, Americans that were murdered by a terrorist, a terrorist attack, including by the an ambassador, which was a very rare event and hadn't happened in decades. So we will continue to pursue this. I expect, as you see, the House will have further hearings on this. And we have, again, called for a select committee. We have, again, asked for uh, the, those witnesses to be able to be brought forward with protection. Uh, often the cuts on the people who cannot afford it most. 
and there is very little being said about the revenue that needs to come uh, from those who can support it. So would you speak to that, please? Yes, uh, I, thank, I thank you very much for your question. Um, as you know, in terms of, the, I mentioned earlier, the President's proposed budget, uh, the President has also proposed changes to, called Chain CPI. And what that is, is it's the COLA to Social Security, it's the rate at which the COLA increases. So it's not a cut to benefits, but it's the rate at which the COLA would increase and calculating it in a different way. Um, I, I actually believe that this is an area I've said before, uh, that we do need to look at, and uh, I'm, I'm willing to look at that along with the president, and I think we should, how we structure it, we need to be sensitive, obviously, to people who are most relying on Social Security, and I will tell you this for our disabled veterans. One of the biggest issues I worry about for them is two things. We have a huge claims law backlog at the VA. That has to be addressed. Second, um, I can already tell you that the first place they're looking to increase costs is for actually co-pays for TRICARE and other uh, benefits uh, that they rely on even more substantially for health care and other assistance. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think that that, to, you know, to ask that burden of them is a real problem, but the chain CPI is something I think we're going to have to look at to see how do we do it in a way uh, that's smart, that the president has that on the table. If we don't reform this program, it will be there for people who need it the most. But I can tell you my, my rule of thumb is going to be this, preserve the program. I think that people like me maybe will receive less because hopefully if, if I continue to do well or maybe at some point I'll, I'll need greater assistance. But, but if I, you know, I think that, that, uh, that, that the people certainly that are in a position uh, to do more, I understand that. We'll have to look at that. But if we don't do anything, this program won't be there. And I think the acknowledgement that the president put that in his budget, this is something we have to talk about and look at and, and how we do it. So that's my view on it. Uh, I'm, and again, I'm going to go back to I'm not for no changes because no changes means that we just kind of get to a point where we drop off a cliff. Very good. The next question is for Margaret, Margaret Orton. Um, lawmakers for both parties have devoted nearly half a billion dollars in taxpayer money over the past two years to build um, improved versions of the Abrams tank, even though senior Army officials have repeatedly said they don't need it. Um, and it seems to come back down to the fact that the plant that builds the tanks is in Ohio, which we all know is a swing state. Um, it seems like for both parties, Lawmakers are reluctant to heed the Pentagon advice because it could jeopardize jobs, or it could jeopardize votes. Um, so, and that's only one example of how our tax dollars are controlled by private interests and especially the defense spending. So, I have a three-part question. Do you support the current bipartisan push to spend an extra uh, $436 million on a weapon that military officials have said they don't want? What programs are you proposing, or at least endorsing, to re-channel misspent dollars on the military into vital um, areas of interest, like clean energy? And uh, do you see any way of supporting, uh, to save jobs, even by federally supporting the conversion of a plant, a plant like the one in Lima, um, to non-military use in the nation's better interest? Okay, I will do my best to answer all three. Uh, on the first one, uh, if the military doesn't want it or need it, no, I don't support it. Um, and so the tank issue is, uh, I think if we're not, we certainly need tanks, but if the military thinks that there's a better use or better product that they can use or they don't need the additional ones, then we shouldn't do it. And in fact, um, it's one of the reasons why I also didn't support and I pushed hard um, to end funding to this missile to nowhere that if anyone receives my newsletter knows that I'm obsessed with because it's called the medium air defense system which is another example of people and they're trying to protect their parochial interests instead of making sure that the money goes to where the military needs it. It's an example just beyond the tank issue, and that is, um, this was a program to replace the Patriot missile. 
It was an agreement we had with the Germans uh, and, and, and other European partners. We spent almost a billion dollars on it. We're never going to get a result for our military that has a missile that they can use. In fact, the Army said they didn't want it. And yet the last time, even though we have sequestration in place, an appropriations bill came to the floor and there were $480 million in it for a missile to nowhere. And you know why? Because a couple of states had, uh, they had business interests in it. They were powerful, you know, powerful members of Congress that could keep that money in. And so I fought for a vote on the floor to get that struck in. And you know what? They blocked me from the majority leader wouldn't have me a vote. And frankly, it was Republicans and Democrats that blocked me from having a vote. Uh, even though I would have gotten that passed because most members of Congress said, hey, if it's never going to get us a result and it's a big chunk of money, why can't we use that for something we actually need? So I will, I will move out. If there's other areas where the military comes to us and says, we don't need this, because frankly, there are some needs. There are things we do need. Um, and there are people like training for our troops that, that they do need. And uh, right now with sequestration, we've cut flying hours 18%, yet we're going to fund a missile to nowhere. So, I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. So, uh, I'm a strong person who believes in a strong national defense, and I serve on the Armed Services Committee. My husband served in Iraq, I, I strongly believe. But there, there are areas where it just gets, there's waste there that can be cut. There are areas where members of Congress have been too influential just to protect their own district as opposed to what's right for the nation. And so I will continue those efforts. Finally, uh, in terms of the, the plant, I don't know enough yet in terms of what that, you know, what that plant could be used for, or what the transition would be if we shut down the Abrams program, what the proper transition would be. I think that would be, have to be something that the local community, like when we had to close over peas, the local community involved in as to what's appropriate uh, for the local community to do and for, for the business in terms of transferring their interests. So, um, so I, I don't think I have a good answer on, I, I believe there'd have to be a lot of business stakeholders and other people, community leaders in that area involved in that decision that I wouldn't know enough to make a, a, an informed decision on right now. Thank <laughs> you. 
The question I have, I am frustrated because uh, in listening to the program of our finances uh, nationally, I've heard this over uh, a couple generations. It doesn't seem to change a whole lot uh, from, from administration to administration to administration. Uh, folks here, we, we somehow have learned to work within a budget, live within a budget. If we don't need it, we don't spend it. Or if we don't have it, we don't spend it. And yet, I look at revenue coming in, and spending is way beyond that. And yet, this keeps happening constantly. Uh, how is this allowed to continue to keep going on? Why will this not be the same case next year or the next year after that? And in terms of the administrative operation of the government, with all the sequestration going on, are there any changes being made in their administrative budgets to reflect sequestration? Or is that being kind of farmed out to people not so close to home? Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Um, let, let me just say that uh, I think it's fair, a fair comment and criticism. And one of the things that, having been a relatively new member there, only a couple of years, uh, I, I came there, focus, let, let's cut spending, let's get this fiscal problem under control. And it's incredible how much uh, the focus of, if you look back at where we are, uh, of each member of Congress and Senate, historically, on both sides of the aisle, has been about what, you know, how, how can I bring home the bacon instead of looking at the big picture uh, of what the country needs. And so it's one of the reasons why, you know, I think it's been good that we've gotten rid of earmarks. Um, but, but it's still a problem. I, since I've been in there in the Senate, I voted at least four or five times to implement GAO reports, just GAO, government accountability reports, to eliminate duplication, waste, fraud in various agencies where they have suggestions where they have multiple agencies working in the same area with multiple programs doing the same thing, none of them accountable. And I'll tell you, not one of them yet has gotten through. One passed the Senate, uh, and some language passed the Senate in the budget, but not one has uh, gotten through all the way to become law. And things just on the things that need to be done in waste and fraud. However, I will tell you this. Um, there is, I think, a renewed focus there on many people's part, understanding that these numbers just don't, we can't continue this. And um, it's something that I get up every day worrying about and focusing on. And so I'm, I think that uh, the attitude change is taking too long, but it's there. Whether it's eliminating earmarks, whether it is uh, the cuts that we have made, the focus now of understanding that we can't get, just keep increasing the debt limit without dealing with the underlying drivers of our debt. Um, I've supported twice balanced budget amendments. They haven't gotten through, but I'm going to continue to support those efforts. But this is going to have to be, it took us, you know, it took years of this attitude, and it's going to take a concerted fight and effort and all of your voices saying this is important to us because you elect us and, and get us, because I, I can tell you it's my focus. I'm going to continue. Um, to cut spending, to get our country together, and on my own budget, um, in the past year I've given 20% back. Uh, in the two years that I've been in the Senate, two and a half years each year, I've given about 20% uh, of my, my, my budget back before sequestration. Before Give people equal pay. 
And listen, I was the first woman to serve as AG. I, I mean, I've got an eight-year-old daughter. Of course I believe people should be paid uh, for what they do equally, regardless of you know, their sex, uh, their, uh, their background. I mean, I, that, that is a, a strong thing, and I believe in forcing our current laws. So um, those measures are in place. I thought adding this other piece was not going to help enhance moving forward and ultimately getting our economy together. Uh, I hope will benefit everyone and opportunities for everyone. And with that, I want to thank all of you. I know many of you, we did not get to your questions. Um, my staff is here. I will respond to your questions. And if there was a question that we didn't get to today that you, we will, we will provide you a written response. Um, and I really appreciate your being so respectful, being here today, taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here. And um, it, it is a privilege uh, to be part of this democracy. And uh, I thank you for being here as, as part of the good old-fashioned New Hampshire Town Hall.